If you would, please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So there was this man named Winston who lived in a high-rise building in a busy part of downtown. He was very much a creature of habit. He wore the same black suit every day, the same white shirt, the same black shoes and socks, and the perfect black tie. He walked to work every day and took the exact same route without variation. One morning, Winston walked out of his high-rise building and turned left to walk his usual route. But, unbeknownst to him, there was a hole in the sidewalk. Winston had never been concerned about the condition of the sidewalk, so the hole caught him completely by surprise, and he fell in. It took some work, but he finally managed to get out of the hole. The next morning, Winston headed out of his high-rise building, turned left to walk his usual route, and since he was very unconcerned about the condition of the sidewalk, he fell in the hole once again. This time it took a little more effort to extract himself from the hole, but the effort was not enough to dissuade him from taking the same route the next morning. On the fifth morning, however, he finally had enough of the hole and instead of turning left, he turned right and walked around the block to avoid the hole. There is a great quip that goes something like this. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again while expecting different results. Most folks would look at Winston and call him insane. Why would anyone continue to turn left knowing there is a hole in the sidewalk? This holds true for the Israelites as well, with their on-again, off-again relationship with God. While their pattern is slightly different than uh, Winston's, their behavior is no less insane. Our passage this morning comes at the end of the book of Joshua and is designed to explain how the Israelites should take responsibility for their history. The history I'm referring to is the lack of perspective regarding their relationship with God. From the time of Genesis all the way through Joshua, the Israelite people witnessed both blessings and depravity because they would serve God one minute and abandon God the next. This pattern of behavior almost becomes comical in the Old Testament to the point that you want to yell at the text, turn right, avoid the hole in the sidewalk. <laughs> but of course, they keep turning left, they keep falling in the hole, and each time they fall in, it is a little harder to get out of the hole. Joshua is one of many leaders or prophets who will plead with the Israelite people to serve God and God alone. In our text this morning, Joshua reminds the people of the faithfulness of Yahweh in bringing them up out of the land of Egypt and is asking the Israelite people to make a decision. Will they enter into an exclusive relationship with the one who has already acted to save them? Or will they serve the new gods of the land they are about to enter? Sometimes we really like to make excuses for our behavior. For the Israelites, their excuse involved their lack of having an original homeland. In the ancient world, gods were geographical. When Abraham was called to lead the land of his ancestors, Ur of the Chaldeans, he was called by Yahweh, the one true living God. Abraham responded. 
But when he entered into Canaan, he was not immune to the gods of that land. When the Israelites were in Egypt, they didn't hesitate to adopt the gods of the Egyptians. Everywhere they landed, there was a battle of their wills, whether to worship the geographical gods of the new land or to honor the one true God. What is striking, though, is that the entire history of the Israelite people is built on their responding to the call of the one true living God, not their allegiance to geographical gods. Joshua uses a brilliant piece of reverse psychology to get the Israelites to surrender their will to God one more time. First, he asked them to put away the gods of their ancestors, those beyond the river in Egypt, and to serve the Lord exclusively. But he gives them an out. He says, now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether that be the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. What strikes me about Joshua's proposition is how he frames it in the negative. The word unwilling is a button pusher kind of word. I can hear my mom saying to me, if you are unwilling to clean your room, Choose this day what your punishment will be. <laughs> okay, so maybe equating cleaning my room versus serving God are not on par with each other. But both have consequences. And both are choices. The people of Israel recognized they were being offered a choice. They had to choose. Just as, they, just as we are confronted with choices today. Joshua's text states that um, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It almost feels like he's shaming the Israelites into obedience. He's calling them to make a choice by throwing down the gauntlet or egging them on with the double dog dare. We're serving the Lord. Are you? And the people respond just as expected. When you're backed into a corner and told that you have to make a choice between life and death, is it really a choice? I fully acknowledge that Joshua was following God's lead in this matter and that he sincerely hoped that the people of Israel comprehended the gravity of the situation. And based on their answer, we assume that they did. But their actions tell a different story. Verses 16 through 18 outline the people's understanding of what God had done for them up to that point. How God led them out of Egypt to the gates of the promised land. How God led them out of slavery. How God performed great miracles on their behalf. How God protected them in the wilderness. And how God sheltered them from other people whose customs and traditions were unlike their own. At the end of this litany of remembrance, there is a resounding, therefore, therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. It sounds good and makes for a great story, but the truth is, their behavior tells us a different story. No matter how many times the Israelites choose God, they consistently served and worshipped other gods. And they did it with zeal. Sound familiar? No matter how many times they fell in the hole, they continued to turn left because that was their routine. Not much has changed over the last several thousand years. Today we are offered the same choice and often we will shout with great enthusiasm, Yes, I will serve the Lord which lasts until the next greatest thing catches our attention. 
There are too many things that compete and vie for our attention. There are too many things that catch us, that trap us. One of the conversations many churches are having is how do we get folks to come back to the church? When I was growing up, it was unheard of to have any kind of local sports competition on Sunday, and most retail stores were closed. Now in many places, sports take precedent and all stores are open for our convenience, except for Chick-fil-A. I think you get my point. <laughs> I've discovered that if I am not engaged on a regular basis with some sort of self-assessment process to help me evaluate the many gods in my life, I can quickly move away from worshiping the one true God. These other gods are enticing. Food, social media, television, computer games, and certainly watching sports. We could, each of us, develop a comprehensive list given enough time. When I allow these things to occupy more space than God with a capital G, then I make way for them to become gods with a little g. One question I ask myself is, what takes up most of my time? Many of us would answer work. And I believe that work can become one of our gods. So how do we avoid following, falling into the hole of worshiping other gods over the one true God? We have to choose again and again every day. I think Joshua understood the dilemma all too well. Not only was he asking the Israelites to choose, but he and his family were making the choice too. We all have to choose. This is a daily process. Every day we submit our will to God's. Every day we decide we want to serve God over other gods. Every day we make a commitment to live according to the teachings of Christ. Every day we choose God. Every day. I wish it were as simple as making a one-time decision to love God with all our hearts, all our minds, and all of our strength. But it is never that simple. We are all prone to falling in love with what the world has to offer. These things are enticing. They look good. God, however, has to be more enticing. Our serving God isn't a Sunday thing, it's a daily thing. God wants a relationship with us, and that doesn't happen if we aren't spending time with God. Just like the Israelites, we are good at saying yes when it is convenient, but serving God isn't always convenient. Notice that I keep using the word serve. Joshua doesn't ask the Israelites to believe in the one true God or to create doctrines about God. Joshua asks the people to serve God. Serving God requires action. We are called to do justice in this world. We are called to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those in prison, to care for widows and orphans. This is serving God. We are to do those things which say loudly to others, these people are godly people because they are doing godly things. We don't do it for the reward, for a ticket to heaven, for pats on the back, or some accolades at a fancy banquet. We serve God because we choose to serve God. It is a choice. I find that the illustration of Winston turning left out of his building is a simple way to illustrate the rut-like behavior we can so easily become prey to. Our lives are governed by routines. 
We live by them because it helps us remember all the things that we have to do throughout a given day. What would happen, though, if we made a commitment every morning to serve God? If this were our number one priority, how would our lives be different? May it be so. Amen.